Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, so I'm, I want you, if you would, to uh, put into the Q&A box, uh, if your organization pays lip service to risk, um, how's that happening? What's the, the nature of that? So I suspect that many of your organizations indeed do pay attention to risk, so the question here is how much attention and whether what the organization is really doing is primarily superficial, um, as I said, paying lip service rather than actually taking risk seriously. I'm going to bump forward here and share with you what I see as the objectives for today. So let's see. First of all, whether we can identify what risk is and how it usually is assessed. And look at the points in a project where risk can and should be assessed and managed. And examine whether and how risk is or is not dealt with at these various points and how it could be dealt with at these various points. Uh, Susan, any luck in the Q&A? Yes, so we have um, some companies do manage risk. We have, we have a formal risk identification and resolution process. And I think that's all the answers we have right now. Okay, so let me caution that having a formal risk identification process does not necessarily mean that the organization is not paying lip service to risk. In fact, I, I fear that formal processes are sometimes a mechanism to avoid taking risk more seriously. The premise is, hey, we have this process, we, we have these meetings, we fill out these reports, uh, therefore we've covered ourselves. And the problem is that that's not sufficient and in fact, in many ways, can interfere with more meaningful risk analysis. Sure, many of you are familiar with Murphy's Law, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. You may be less familiar with O'Brien's Law, Murphy was an optimist. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with risk management and, and the, the major steps of it. So steps one through five are part of planning, identifying the potential risks, prioritizing them, doing it qualitatively, quantitatively, assessing the causes, and then deciding what to do about each of those major risks. You could accept the risk or define some kind of a mitigation strategy. So you could avoid doing the risky thing. I, I point out that I have avoided taking uh, uh, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk uh, rocket into space. I also can't afford to do it, but I am consciously not doing it. It's a risky thing. I don't care what they say. It is risky and it's not worth it to me. In the project world, we tend to focus mostly on controlling the likelihood and or impact of a risk. So in the project world, testing is often a major risk control technique. If you think about uh, other situations, for instance, uh, automobiles, what do we have? We have things like seat belts. Seat belts are there to reduce the impact of an accident. You have 
uh, all the various uh, radar detection uh, devices, you know, to tell you that you're getting too close to something in front of you or that there's uh, some car or something in your blind spot. And of course, that's been raised to a, a higher order of magnitude with the self-driving vehicles. And uh, those are still, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, people are realizing that they're not quite as perfect as they need to be. But those are things that help reduce the risk's likelihood. And then there are transferring some or all of the risk. So everybody these days, at least in the US, is required to have automobile insurance, an insurance policy is transferring some of the risk to the insurer. In a project, you transfer risk by doing things like engaging experts. That's uh, transferring the risk because you're relying on, on participants in the project who may have more skills or knowledge or better tools. But you're also transferring some of the risk legally because the, the consultant or outsourcer or whatever is taking on some of the burden. And then typically step five is to define a contingency plan, what to do if the risk occurs anyhow. Now, steps one to five are all planning activities. Those are things that organizations tend to do a lot more than step six, which is actually carry out those plans. Okay. And so this is an example of where organizations do the planning, but then don't do the full implementation. And that's an example of paying uh, lip service. Sure, many of you are familiar with the elements of risk and the uh, calculation of risk exposure or, or just risk. Basically, the elements of risk are impact if the risk occurs and likelihood that the risk will occur. And risk exposure or just risk is calculated as the impact times the likelihood. And there are a number of uh, determinants of impact, how severe the damage is. So uh, you know, many of you are familiar with uh, uh, tornadoes and hurricanes. A category five hurricane will inflict much more damage than a category one because the wind speeds are higher and so forth. The number of people affected also makes a difference. So if that category five hurricane is mainly out in the country where there are relatively few people, it's going to have a far smaller impact than if it hits a major metropolitan area like Houston or, or New Orleans or New York City. Sometimes the consequences exceed the actual physical damage. Sometimes the consequences can cause a, an organization to, to be put out of business. In the project world, what we tend to look at are the cost and time and effort and our ability to fix the problem. And impact is reduced when there are workarounds. Likelihood is increased as projects get bigger and more complex. More things to go wrong, it's harder to find them. If we're dealing with technology that's new to the world, it's more likely to have problems than technology that's had a chance to, to get its wrinkles uh, detected and, and ironed out. If the technology is not new to the world, but is new to your organization or to your team, you're still more likely to have problems because you don't have the familiarity with it. 
Many of you may be familiar with the mutual fund ads that prior performance does not predict future performance. In the risk world, prior performance does predict future performance. If you are dealing with a product that has had problems in the past, you are on notice that it is more likely to have problems in the future. And even though it is not politically correct, who does the work is a major determinant of the likelihood of problems. We all know that our teams and the teams we're familiar with have some people who when they do work, it is rock solid. We've got other people that when they do work, we have to double and triple check it because we know that they make many more mistakes. If the people doing the work don't have suitable skill, don't have suitable motivation, don't have suitable methods, they are much more likely to have problems. So these are the things that we tend to look at. Many of you may be familiar with the quantifying, quote unquote, uh, risk exposure using some kind of a, a two by two matrix of impact and likelihood where this can be done uh, graphically, for instance, and it can be done just mathematically. So in this example, uh, impact, if it's a high impact, call it three points, medium impact two points, low impact one point. Similarly, likelihood, high likelihood three points, medium likelihood two points, low likelihood one point. And so low impact, low likelihood, one box, high impact, high likelihood, nine boxes. And that can simply be calculated out now, what would happen if we changed the scale? Instead of using one to three, we used one to five. All of a sudden, what's the picture look like? Which, which is the bigger risk? The risk of 25 on a one to five scale or the risk of nine on a one to three scale? Well, I think you'd agree that the 25 looks like a much bigger risk than the, the nine, when in fact they represent identical risks, but not identical interpretations. And then what if we bump it up one to 10? Okay. That'll make it an even bigger looking risk. It's the same risk, but it looks bigger, it gets more attention. Sometimes people will use nonlinear non scales to give greater impact or greater uh, attention to impact or to likelihood. Sometimes people use these as percentages. And I'll caution you against that because it's really misleading. It implies a, uh, a precision that is not there and it gets you up to 100% which is not a risk. So if you would, once again, put in the Q&A, and we'll ask Susan to keep an eye on this, points in your project when risk is formally and explicitly identified and analyzed. And if your organization doesn't explicitly identify and analyze risk, write none. That's informative as well. Now, for those points where you do, where your organization does explicitly identify and analyze risk, candidly evaluate how effective that risk analysis is. So for each of those points where your organization does explicitly identify and analyze risk, put a one if it's a, a low effectiveness, three if it's medium effectiveness, and five if it's high effectiveness. And if you can, 
share with us any issues that you see, especially if you're rating it down on the low end. I guess the other side of it is not so much issues, but explanations for why you feel that it's high effectiveness. So I've given you a, a big assignment here. I appreciate that it's going to take you a minute or two to uh, put that answer into the Q&A. And, and uh, Susan, when you see something there, uh, uh, please share it with us. Uh, I'm going to once again head on because I want to point out uh, a couple of the places where risk tends to be identified and analyzed. The first place is with regard to project management. And I think if you look at the books and articles and checklists and speeches and so forth about risk, I think you will find that the great majority of what is written and said about risk are dealing with project management risks. And that this is when you get, uh, shall we say, direction or guidance from the people that you report to and the people they report to, very often it's focused on project management risks. Project management risks are primarily things like inadequate time and inadequate resources and timing issues, especially with outsiders. So we're, many of us are familiar with projects where we're working with uh, outside suppliers. And one of our risks that we're often concerned with and conscious of is whether those outside suppliers are in fact going to deliver things that they have promised to deliver, are they going to deliver them on time? Now, in your world, is project management risk, is that a point at which risk is evaluated? Is it actually done and do people pay lip service to it? And so you can put that in the Q&A as well. So Susan, have we gotten any responses? We do. We have a, a four. Risks are identified, mitigated with the responsible person identified. Um, we have um, one or two, we have two threes, and we have one one. Aha. Uh -huh. And <laughs> is there any more information? That's all for now. Okay. Well, so we've got uh, we've got a pretty good spread there. I don't think uh, I don't think we could have come up with a normal distribution any better than uh, uh, you know four three three one. So excellent. So thank you, folks. And if um, if you are sharing us about your project management risks, please uh, do uh, uh, put that in the Q and A as well. And uh, if, if project management risks are something that your organization does pay attention to, uh, you know, do they do it or, and do they just pay lip service to it? So uh, I'll venture forward. Um, something that I alluded to a minute ago. I'm going to suggest that one of the reasons why the emphasis on project management risks isn't very useful is because most project management risks are not risks, they're certainties. A risk has to be uncertain to some degree. And Project management risks really are not risks. They generally represent practices that the organization uses project after project. And those practices are poor practices and uniformly produce 
the types of bad results that people are calling project risks. That is, projects are not just late and, and over budget and wrong because of statistical variation, which is what risk is really addressing, but rather they're wrong and late and over budget and, and not what they need to be because the way of the way that the organization does projects. Now that's that's a hard message and of course people don't want to hear that. Perhaps some of you can identify with that. Now, if you can, <coughs> you want to share with us, please do put it in the Q and A. Part of the difficulty with risk analysis and risk mitigation, <coughs> excuse me, is that organizations commonly confuse causes and effects. Effects, that's that's risk, impact times likelihood. The effects are why we care. That's the bad outcomes. And those effects can be in all kinds of, of places, business effects, management effects, product or technical effects. Causes are what we address to mitigate, either reduce and or eliminate those effects. The problem is that most folks generally pay attention to causes or things that are likely to cause or trigger bad effects. But the causes are not a suitable basis for prioritization. Effects are the meaningful basis for prioritization. And focusing on causes, while it seems logical, there's something that I think is going to cause us trouble it tends to cause us to overlook other often equally or even more important risks. So in your own experience, have you seen people kind of mixing causes and effects and quite possibly over-focusing on causes and paying lip service to the effects side of it. So if that's happening in your world, please do share that with us in the Q&A and uh, any more description of that so that people can understand what's happening in your world. Once again, I'm going to venture forward, unless we've got anything in the Q&A to share, Susan. Um, from the previous question you had about risk, um, we did have project management risk was listed. I think back in on slide maybe 17. Yeah. Okay, and that's all for now, looks like. Okay, great. Well, once again, if you share with us, you're going to get more out of this than your fellow attendees are going to get more out of this. Another point in the project where risk is often addressed is with requirements. And basically, the issues with requirements are what is the impact if a requirement is not met or if it is met inappropriately? And what's the likelihood that that requirement will not be met or will be met inappropriately. Far less 
common in risk analysis regarding requirements is whether the requirements are the real requirements and whether they in fact are right and whether the requirements in fact are reviewed. In my experience, it's common that requirements are either not reviewed or when they are reviewed, the review is just much weaker than people realize. So some of you who've attended my sessions before, this may be repetition, but I think it, it really demands repetition. In my world, I think there are two types of requirements, and I know that other uh, uh, approaches uh, make different types of distinctions. But to me, the two important types of requirements are business versus product requirements. Business requirements on the left are from the perspective of and in the language of the business, the user, the stakeholder, the customer. They are conceptual and they exist within the business environment. And because they exist, they need to be discovered. Business requirements are what? Business what's that when delivered or satisfied or met, provide value. They provide value by serving business objectives, solving business needs, solving problems, taking opportunities, meeting challenges. Now, I think there's a good chance that that's very similar to what you and your colleagues mean by requirements. Recognize that there are usually many possible ways to accomplish the real business requirements on the left. Product, system, software requirements, and I use those terms interchangeably. About that? I use those terms interchangeably. Product requirements are from the perspective of and in the language of a human-defined product or system. Humans define designs. Real business requirements on the left exist and need to be discovered, whereas products represent a human-defined product or system, which is presumably one of those many possible ways presumably how to accomplish the presumed real business requirements on the left. And product requirements on the right are often phrased in terms of external functions or features that the product or system uh, is designed to perform. And those are often also referred to as functional specifications and then go or functional requirements and then going along with that are non-functional requirements or specifications. Hope you can see that products by themselves provide no value. A product provides value if and only if and only to the extent that the product, in fact, satisfies or meets real business requirements on the left. That's where value comes from. Not the product, but what the product does in terms of accomplishing real business requirements. Some of you are probably familiar with the term creep. And by the way, if you go back and look at how the term requirements is used in your world, there's a very good chance that when people use the term requirements, they're talking about requirements 
of the product system or software that is being created. Okay. Now, creep is changes to requirements that people think have been settled upon. And we know that creep is one of the major causes of project overruns and disappointments and other problems. Phrased another way, what's the risk that the project is going to get into trouble? Well, one of the major causes of that risk is creep. The conventional wisdom is that creep is caused by requirements, meaning product requirements on the right, that are not sufficiently clear or testable. Now, I'm going to suggest that while clarity and testability of product requirements on the right is certainly important, that much of creep occurs because the product requirements on the right, regardless of how clear and testable they are, turn out not to satisfy the real business requirements on the left. And the primary reason why the product requirements on the right fail to satisfy the real business requirements on the left is because the real business requirements on the left have not been defined adequately. And the primary reason why the real business requirements on the left are not defined adequately is because the conventional wisdom is that the product requirements on the right are, quote unquote, the requirements. Perhaps you can identify with that. I think you'll see that what is called risk is really not a risk at all. It's a very predictable and preventable outcome of the way people conceptualize and deal with requirements inappropriately. Now, this is often articulated in what I call the levels model of requirements. And the levels model of requirements is promulgated by many authorities or authors on requirements. In fact, it's incorporated in BABOC, the business analysis body of knowledge. And according to the levels model of requirements, business requirements are high level and vague and decompose into product requirements, which are detailed. So according to the levels model, the only difference between business requirements and product requirements is a level of detail or a level of abstraction. And I wouldn't be surprised if many of you are accustomed to referring to different levels of requirements. Now, hopefully, you're beginning to get an inkling of why the levels model is wrong. Because business requirements are what? Product requirements are how? What do not decompose into how? Rather, how, <clears throat> how is a response to the what? All the detail in the world on the how, which is what the levels model encourages, won't make up for the fact that we don't know what the business requirements are. And so the key to reducing creep is to realize that business requirements are not just high level and vague, but that they need to be driven down to more detail. And that no matter how far down in detail you drive business requirements, they are always business deliverable what's that when delivered contribute to providing value. Driving business requirements down to detail never turns them into products. But driving them down to detail facilitates 
designing products that in fact map to and will satisfy the real business requirement. And that's the key to avoiding creep. Since creep is the major contributor to project problems, it's not a risk. It's a certainty of having the wrong requirements model. Any questions or comments uh, at this point, Susan? Well, we do have one comment. Someone said risk that no one saw was a pandemic, which gave us positive and negative risks. Okay, excellent point. Now that, let me just step aside here for a moment. Um, the pandemic, created all kinds of situations that largely interfered with our business's ability to do things. And then it also created some opportunities, especially for Zoom and uh, people who use Zoom and similar techniques. Now, for the 800,000 people that died, that was a pretty big impact. Okay, and unfortunately, that continues on. And once again, it's a preventable, largely preventable impact. And, uh, you know, we, we continue to see that there's not simple answers to get people to adopt uh, techniques that might control the impact more. Now, yes. Pandemic turned out to be a giant risk that was overlooked in practically every organization in every country in the world. That is perhaps going to happen less in the future, but the fact is that all things considered, we shouldn't be surprised that somebody who's focusing on a particular project really isn't looking at the larger world. You know, there are risks of asteroids hitting us and volcanoes and earthquakes and uh, hurricanes and tornadoes and all kinds of stuff that generally tends to be out of sight, out of mind. And yes, they are risks, and we do need to pay attention to them because the impact, if they do occur, can be very great. On the other hand, historically, the likelihood has been pretty remote. So, in 2019, pandemics were 100 years out of sight, out of mind. Shouldn't be surprised that most people weren't on top of it. On the other hand, there are certain types of organizations whose job it is to be aware of and pay attention to things like pandemics. And in fact, our federal government in the U.S. Uh, had an organ part of the federal government back in the uh, Obama presidency formed a uh, formed a, a group or task force or whatever, with the responsibility of looking out for things like pandemics. And that group was dissolved. So there was an opportunity, but that opportunity was disregarded. Now, I don't know more of the details, okay? 
And maybe if that group had continued, still wouldn't have been any difference. One thing we can see is that even with even with something with as significant an outcome as a pandemic, there are a lot of people that continue to pay lip service or less attention to it. So we shouldn't be overly surprised when things that are slightly less uh, horrific uh, might affect our own projects if people aren't really paying attention to that as well. But that's uh, an excellent point. Thank you for your comment. So requirements reviews, many organizations don't review requirements at all. Many of the organizations that do review requirements use methods that are far weaker than people realize. Typical requirement review uses one or two methods to review the requirements, and when we have look at them in a more objective and an informed fashion, we find that those methods are often relatively weak, relying largely on people thinking of things that they may or may not think of because they don't have good guidance. In addition, almost all of the attention to requirements this is true if you look at the, the books and articles and standards on requirements. Almost all of the attention is on formats and clarity. Just between us, formats and clarity are things that you can examine with minimal skill or knowledge. You don't really need to know much about the requirements being analyzed to tell whether a requirement seems unclear. Clarity is important, but it's not as important as content. And simply relying upon people to spot stuff because they care or are somewhat knowledgeable in the field it is hard to spot stuff. It is especially hard to spot things that are overlooked. And it's hard in many instances to spot things that are wrong because that takes the greatest skill and knowledge. Now, once again, if your organization conducts requirements reviews, please put in the Q&A whether those requirements reviews are treated with lip service. So one of the examples or one of the symptoms of a requirements review being treated with lip service is that the requirements review findings tend not to have much weight. Reviewers say, hey, we found all these issues, and the powers that be say, well, that's all well and good, but we got to go into production. So if you if you can put that into the lip service, give it, or put that into the Q and A, give us a little more discussion or description of the lip service that you're familiar with, if that's occurring. In what I call proactive testing, and uh, if you want to find, find out more about that, please do contact me. Part of proactive testing has more than 21 ways to review requirements. So I said most folks use one or two techniques that are relatively weak and focus on formats and clarity. There are 20, more than 21 ways that proactive testing uses include many much more powerful special techniques, not just for reviewing formats and clarity, but for special techniques that help find overlooked requirements and special techniques that help confirm that the requirements, in fact, are complete and correct. And 
proactive testing also looks at more than 15 ways to review designs, one of which is, is the design responsive to the requirements? Now, these are all, the proactive testing techniques are all risk-based techniques, powerful methods for identifying risks identifying risks early enough to make meaningful actions based upon dealing with them and for meaningfully prioritizing. So a third point in a project where risk is addressed is testing. Testing is our main method of reducing risks in products and systems. There's a simple relationship. The more risk, the more testing needs to be done. Traditional testing does analyze risk. And it looks at features and components, rating the impact and likelihood that a feature will be wrong, rating the impact and likelihood that a component will be wrong. So features, that's what the product does, often referred to as requirements risk, sometimes identified as system menu choices. Components, that's how the system is put together. That's how it's implemented. Okay? And with regard to both features and components, Risk analysis identifies vulnerabilities, things that can fail, threats that trigger those failures, situations where failure is more likely, and then the quality, the cost, and schedule, and who the victims are, and how much they will be damaged or impacted if it fails. And then you multiply the impact times the likelihood and test the highest risk things most. Very often, those are the things that are done most, things that other things depend upon, things that are likely to fail, as we said, big and complex, new and change stuff, and the stuff that must work. So if you're working with a car, seat belts, auto work, brakes absolutely have to work. Now, that's the typical way that testing analyzes risk. That's not wrong. But too often, the way that testing analyzes risk comes with a bunch of issues that are part of the issue is that those issues are seldom recognized. So first of all, traditional testing is reactive. It's reacting to what's in the design or even in the code. And too often, the risks that are being identified in the design are not the right risks because the really big risks are what's wrong and missing in the design. Secondly, traditional testing risk analysis comes too late. Very often, it doesn't occur until after the code is already written and all the defects are already there. And so, at best, the risk analysis is focusing on catching the risks that are already there rather than the more important prevention of those risks. And traditional risk analysis tends to be too little tends to focus on test cases, which represent small risks. And when we focus on the small risks, it tends to distract us from the larger and medium-sized risks. So consider a typical testing approach, risk approach. Create test cases, analyze and prioritize the risks that they address, and run the, the higher risk tests. Okay. That's 
seems logical until we look at that in a different way. So let's say that we've created 100 test cases. We have time to run 10 of them. Consider all the time that we spent creating 90 test cases that we don't have time to run. What's the value that we got from that? Basically zero or in some ways less than zero because it distracted us from possibly identifying other test cases that we didn't think of. And in fact, what are the chances that those test cases, those 100 test cases, were the right 100. So proactive testing comes at this in a much different way. We start with identifying and prioritizing large risks. And then for those that are most important, we'll drive down to the medium-sized risks related to them, analyze and prioritize them. And then for those medium-sized risks that are most important for the most important large risks, then we'll use similar special techniques to identify more of the ordinarily overlooked risks, to help us identify things that are wrong and missed in the design. We only create test cases and execute test cases for the most important small risks of the most important medium-sized risks of the most important large risks. But not only are the tests that we're spending our time on creating the ones that are most important, but we're able to create and execute more, more important tests. We get far more bang for our buck. And we're doing this early in the development process so that the defects that are primarily causing those risks, which are defects of requirements and design, can be addressed before they turn into code defects. We let testing drive development so that we identify the risks early before the code is built. We build the system pieces to enable testing the high risks first before we build other things dependent upon those high risks that otherwise will need to be redone if those high risks get built and turn out to be real. And we also plan and design proactive user acceptance testing early for execution at the end. And that includes identifying requirements-based tests as well as identifying what I call proactive user acceptance criteria that reveals many overlooked and wrong requirements and helps the development process with its technical testing catch problems before they get to user acceptance testing. And all of this stuff is prioritized based on risk. Now, a bonus. Analyzing risk in production, because in my experience, most organizations simply react to problems in production and very seldom use production situations as an opportunity to analyze and deal with risk. So production risks are absolutely after the project is typically considered over. People don't pay attention to them. They're not conscious of them. They don't even pay lip service to them. And they tend to act as if the, the things that occur in production, each one is unrelated to the others. The big issue is, should we fix it now, fix it later, don't fix it at all? Let's pay attention to the symptoms, not the causes. And 
Consequently, they missed the opportunity to improve the processes that created those situations. So hopefully we've seen what risk is and how it's usually assessed. And you've seen the points in a project where risk can be assessed and managed, where it should be assessed and managed, and where it may or may not, in fact, be dealt with, and how well it is dealt with, if at all, at these various points. This is a diagram of the courses in consulting that I do, including courses on risk analysis per se, and requirements, and testing, and uh, software acquisition, and project management, all these places where risk is a part of it. And if you want to find out more about that or, or anything else that I do, or if I can help you, please don't hesitate to contact me at robin at gopromanagement.com. And uh, so, Susan, any, any other comments, questions? Please, if you've got questions or comments, put them in the Q&A box, and uh, Susan will uh, share them with us. Let's see, we do have one. What are some common risks you have found across projects? Common risks across projects, uh, the, the big ones are the ones that aren't really risks, which are that the way people do projects pretty much creates a lot of the problems that are called risk. The other big part of it uh, that I attend to uh, especially is with regard to requirements, where people tend to define product requirements, and then the product turns out not to provide the value that people were looking for because they have neglected to adequately identify what I call the real business requirements, which are what provide value when they're satisfied by the product. And the product doesn't satisfy them because the real business requirements have not been identified adequately. Thank you so much, Robin, for joining us today. Thank you all. Don't hesitate to contact me with questions, comments, anything else that I can help you with.